Hi, my name is Jacob. I love making iOS quick tip videos on YouTube. And in this particular video, there are 50 of them to help you make the most of your iPhone now you're on iOS 17. I bet there are tons and tons of things here that you didn't know were possible, but your phone can now do. So grab a coffee or a drink, sit down, and prepare to learn about all the cool things that your iPhone can do. Let's jump straight in and see what's new with standby mode. The standby mode in iOS 17 is a really good way of using your iPhone as like a little secondary display on your desk or by your nightstand or in the kitchen. You can have a clock on there, of course, and you can actually customize what this clock looks like. Now, there are two different ways of doing this. One, you can change the whole clock style itself simply by swiping up and down to move through the clocks. And two, which is quite well hidden, is you can customize the color. Now, to change the color of your clock face, all you have to do while it's in standby mode is tap and hold on the clock face you want to change, and then press the white dot in the bottom right corner. Then you have different options at the bottom and different color effects that you can apply. Some of these are quite subtle, some are quite playful, but as you choose between them, you can choose a style that you really like the look of. I really like this particular one. It feels very playful, especially when the clock changes off, just like that. As I go through and I can customize the looks of the other ones, I can really fine tune how this feature works. I can choose the clock face that works best for me. And because it links to the MagSafe charger it's on, if I choose one clock face at work and a different one at home, it will remember that for me and it will change automatically. The only one you can't change the color on is the world clock, but you can add new cities to here. And you can do that simply by opening the clock app on your iPhone and adding a new time zone, a new city from there. The brilliant new standby feature for iPhone is really customizable. And when you're in standby mode, so when your iPhone is horizontal on a charger, you can actually customize exactly what you see. Now I've made videos on changing how the clock looks and changing other various cosmetic things, but the widgets here are also customizable. If I swipe horizontally, I can go between the clock, the photos and the widget screens. And on the widget screen, if I tap and hold on one of those two halves, I actually get a widget picker just like I would do on my home screen on the iPhone. Now you might notice that I've got quite a few widgets here already and I can swipe up and down between them. This is what's called a smart stack, just like you might have on your home screen. And this is when your iPhone will try and predict what widget you want at what time, and it will cycle through automatically. I'm going to make a screen to go on my desk by my office when my phone's on charge. So I want to actually choose two widgets to be here all the time. So I'm going to tap and hold on the right hand widget, and then I'm going to turn off smart stack. And from here, I'm going to add a new widget. At the moment, there are only Apple widgets on my screen here. But by the time you're watching this, there'll be loads of third party apps. So all the other apps you use will have their widgets here as well. I'm going to go on to music and I'm going to add this now playing widget. And just like I mentioned with those smart stacks, I'm going to turn off smart rotate and make sure it stays on the music screen for me. Because it's an interactive widget, I can also use this to play and pause my music. And then on the left hand side, I want to customize this as well to make it a home kit widget so I can turn on my fan and my lights in the office straight from my standby screen. Again, I'm going to turn off that smart rotate. And because it's a widget, just like anywhere else on the iPhone, when you selected the widget, in this case home, I can tap it again to edit the different things in that widget. For this one, I'm going to add the four items that I want manually, and then I can have that widget locked in place too. When I come out of the editing screen, I've now got my home kit on the left and my music on the right, all of which is fully interactive. So I can tap on a light to turn it on or tap on the fan. And if I want to go to my music controls when a song is playing, all I'm going to do is press on the little speaker icon at the top, and that brings up this beautiful full screen music view. Obviously from here I can change tracks and all of those sort of things. And at the bottom, if I swipe this away, I go back to my standby screen that I've now fully customized. The standby feature in iOS 17 is brilliant. When you put your iPhone horizontally on the charger, it will show a bigger clock or a big widget, whatever you decide you want to have. But it also works at nighttime. Now, if you've got your phone beside your bed charging, you may not want it to be really bright and in your face. In fact, I certainly wouldn't if I'm trying to sleep. So we're going to use night mode on standby. To get this set up, we're first going to go into the settings app and we're going to scroll down until we find standby. From here, there's an option in the middle called night mode and you're going to turn night mode on if it isn't already. There's also the option to wake when movement is detected. And that means your phone screen will go completely off until you start moving your hand in front of it until you wake up, at which point it will light up with the red tone that I'll show you in a minute. Okay, with those two settings enabled, all that's left to do is to go to bed. 
Night mode automatically comes on when the room is dark enough. It is not based on time or alarm or anything else. It's just based on the ambient light in the room. So with it on my nightstand, if I turn the lights off, you'll see night mode turns on. And you can see night mode has this really rich red color. Rather than being bright in your face, it's quite subtle. The screen brightness goes down, so it won't disturb you when you're sleeping. If you leave this for about a minute or so, the screen will go off completely until you then wave your hand in front of it, if you turn that option on. With standby mode on iOS 17, you have a few different options as to how a notifications appear. They can either be quite subtle, or they can be very obvious and show all the content in that notification. Depending on how you're using standby mode, perhaps you want to use it at work and concentration is important, you might want to change these settings. So we do this in the settings app, and then we scroll down to where it says standby. From here, we then have a few options for notifications. The first and most obvious thing I can do is simply to turn off notifications. That means that most things won't show up on the home screen, apart from what are called critical alerts, things which you really have to see right now. They will still show up. But with the notifications turned off, you shouldn't be disturbed at all during your work. With notifications turned on, you'll then get the full notification on your standby screen the minute it comes in. But you could use the second option here to show the info only when you tap on it, if you wanted slightly more privacy. That way you won't get the full notification unless you actively tap on the screen to get all the information. It will also unlock your phone using Face ID to check it's really you. That means that your notifications are that little bit more private. So if you're in like a public space, they won't be able to be seen by someone walking by. They're only ready to be seen when you tap on the screen. So a few different things you can change on standby to make your notifications work the way you want them to. When you use standby on a MagSafe charger, your iPhone is actually clever enough to recognize the serial number of that charger itself. And every one is unique. What that means is that if you customize a home screen, say on your bedside nightstand, to have the sleep and maybe the clock widgets on show, then it will remember those settings linked to that MagSafe charger. That means the next day, if you go perhaps to the office or to work, and you want to have a big colorful clock on your desk so you know when lunch is, you can choose that standby mode. And again, because you're on a MagSafe charger, it will remember and it will link that standby mode and that location. So the beauty of that, of course, is when you go home and you put your phone on the nightstand when you go to bed, it will remember you wanted the clock and the sleep settings that you had before. It's a really nice little feature to have, and it makes standby that bit more useful because you haven't got to be changing it every single time you use it. Of course, there are lots of good changes in the Messages app as well. And here are some of them now. Okay, let's go for a quick tips speed record. I've got a message right here with my mum, and in the past, if I wanted to reply to a particular message, I had to tap and hold by long pressing, then press reply, and then type in the message. It's quite a few steps. Nowadays, on iOS 17, all you have to do is swipe the message sideways, and it will open up a reply box straight away that I can type in and then press send. It will do it as a threaded conversation for me, and it is super quick. Phew, that was quite a quick tip. I guess the coffee this morning really helped. Now, if you're anything like me, there's probably nothing that annoys you more in the world than getting a voice message in the text thread. I'm texting you, I don't want to phone you. Anyway, when you get that voice message, you have to find somewhere quiet, then you have to listen to it and remember what was said before it gets deleted. It's, it's a whole thing. Well, iOS 17 is here to help. As you can see, while I've been talking, that very annoying Jacob has been sending me a voice message. I can't be able to listen to it, I'm too busy, I'm making videos. But look, iOS 17 has transcribed that message for me and I can tap on here and read the whole message without ever having to listen to it. That means if I'm on the train, I've got no signal, if it's just really noisy, I can still see what was said, and I can decide if I need to reply to it now or not. Now, this is a really great feature, but it only works between people who are up to date on their iOS versions. So if you're messaging someone from an older device, you won't see that transcription. And at the moment, it only works in US English. So if you're not on US English and you want to try it, you need to go to settings and then region and change your region to the United States. I'm sure it'll be coming everywhere else really soon. Your keyboard in iOS 17 is going to feel quite different to how you've been used to it before in iOS 16. And it's hard to kind of put a finger on exactly why, but the autocorrect is a big, big part of it. The autocorrect feature is actually far more intelligent than it's been before. It's using machine learning to work out what it thinks you want to say as you're typing. So any typos or mistypes are actually corrected before you even notice. 
that makes demoing how to change a mistake quite tricky because actually I'm trying hard to use some weird place names and things here, but it's just doing it perfectly for me. Let me just do one more message and this time I'll deliberately misspell a word. So I'm going to type in autocorrect and put a random letter in the middle, just like this. But you see straight away it's autocorrected, the word autocorrect. Now, this is great, but sometimes if you're putting in a person's name or a place or perhaps a made-up word that you want to keep, it's going to then change it to something different. But all you have to do now is tap on the word that changed and you can immediately revert back to exactly what you typed in, not what the phone thinks you typed in. It is hard to kind of put into words exactly how this feature feels when you're using it, but it makes typing on the iPhone a much more enjoyable and accurate experience. So by all means, I'd encourage you to go and check it out. There's a new way of searching messages in iOS 17 that makes it really easy to find the exact content or message or attachment that you want. If I jump into the Messages app and then press the search bar at the top, I want to find a picture of a cat that my fiance Safi sent. So I'm going to search for Safi, first of all, and then it will show the contacts that match that name. I'll tap onto Safi here. You can see at the top in the search bar that that's now become a grey box. That means it's a search filter. So the next thing you type in will be a second filter. Now, I could type in photo here, but actually it suggested it for me just below. If I tap onto photo, it will now only show messages from Safi where she has sent a photo. But I want to narrow it down one more time, so I'm going to tap into the top search bar and type in cat. And just like that, I've now got all the photos of cats that my fiancé Safi has sent me, and trust me, there are a lot. Anyway, I found the one that I want. It's this awesome picture of Pudding having a big stretch in the garden. And if I come out of the picture, it was actually sent in a group chat to myself, my fiancé and my mum, which means it's automatically searched all the messages, not just the ones between myself and Safi. It's a really powerful search tool built right into messages. How many times have you had a conversation thread with someone and you've been saying, oh, I'm 10 minutes away, I'm five minutes away, nearly there, nearly there. Well, you can actually do it much easier now on iOS 17, and that is you can just share your live location with that contact for a set amount of time. All I'm going to do is press the plus button next to my text box, and then from here I can choose location. Straight away, you'll see a map that comes up with your current location, and when you press that blue share button, you have the option of sharing it for an hour, until the end of the day, or indefinitely. Depending on who you're messaging and how that conversation's going, you can choose the most appropriate one here for you. I'm going to go for an hour for this message. And just like that, when you send it, a live map will go into that message thread, and anyone in the conversation can see your current location, even if you're moving and you're out and about. If I wanted to stop sharing this, I can simply tap on the map, and the bottom of my screen I can press stop sharing. And remember, this works in group chats as well. So if you share your location, everyone in that group can see where you are, even when you're out and about and moving. And if other people in that group want to share their location too, you'll be able to keep track on where they are, and you can all make sure you're meeting at the same place at the right time. The check-in feature on iOS 17 lets your friend or family member know when you've arrived home safely. Here's how it works. So on the screen, I've got both my iPhone and my fiance Safi's iPhone, and Safi's on her way home from work. So she's going to start a check-in for me so I can make sure she gets home safely. Obviously, in this case, I'm home anyway, so it's all a bit pointless, but hey, for the video, you'll understand what I mean. So what Safi's going to do is she'll press the plus button on that message toolbar, and that will bring up the new messages app screen. And then from here, she's going to choose check-in. Now, at this point, check-in works in two different ways. It will either use your location and a known location you're going to to work out when you should get there, or you can do it manually by setting a timer. We'll do the timer one now. So for Safi to walk home from work, it takes between 10 and 15 minutes. So when she goes to edit on that timer, she can set the exact length of time for the check-in to be active for. Now, nothing's going to happen during those 15 minutes, unless she wants to call for help using check-in. But what will happen is on my phone, I'll get a little message like this that says she's begun that check-in process. If after 15 minutes, Safi hasn't got home, so she hasn't ended the check-in, or she hasn't interacted with her phone, then I'll perhaps get a prompt to let me know that maybe things aren't quite as they should be. This will also happen if she makes an emergency SOS call, it happens automatically. So, let's jump forward a little bit, in fact, let's jump forward about 14 and a half minutes into the future. And now Safi's timer is about to run out. On my phone, so far nothing's changed, I've still got that check-in visible in messages. But on her phone, she now has this new check-in notification on her lock screen. Now this notification only lets you make changes when your phone is unlocked, so someone can't just steal someone's phone and end it. But Safi has the choice here to end the check-in, which means she's got home safely, or to extend the timer to make it last a bit longer, maybe she's gone to the shops on the way home or something. 
If she extends the timer, she can choose by what length she wants to do that, and it will update on my phone automatically by saying she's extended her timer. However, in this case, let's assume she's back home now and that she's going to end her check-in timer. That means that on my phone, I get a notification saying that she's home, it's complete, and everything is good. But if for any reason it wasn't good, maybe she didn't interact with that notification at all, she didn't choose to end or extend, or maybe she didn't make it home in time, then her phone, after a certain amount of time, would start sharing data with me. Her last known location, her battery level, her Wi-Fi and signal status, all of those things that could help me find her. So what we've got here is a feature which on the surface looks really simple and friendly to use, but underneath is actually really, really powerful should you ever need to use it. Photos has received lots of really cool updates this year. Check out some of these new things you can do in Photos. Being able to recognise and tag people in your photos has been a really helpful feature in iOS over the years. And now with iOS 17, you can tag your pets as well which means that you can search for a picture of your dog and your mum at the beach together and it will find it for you. It's really clever. If I go onto this photo here of Poppy and Mabel in the woods and I swipe up to get the information, you might notice in the bottom left corner of that picture there are two little circles, one for each dog that's been detected. When I tap onto the little circle with Poppy's face in, I have the option to name this pet and I'm simply going to type in Poppy on this screen. I'll do the same for Mabel as well, I wouldn't want her feeling left out. I'll tap on her little picture, and I'll call that one Mabel. Now, after assigning Mabel her name, it's actually asking me to review some extra photos. These are pictures that it thinks might be of Mabel, but it's not completely sure. And actually, it's right to get me to check, because these are previous Irish wolfhounds, not Mabel at all. I'm going to unselect them before I move on. But now, if I go back to the album screen, and then scroll down to where the People album lives, it's now called People and Pets, I can tap onto there, and straight away you'll see my free cats are on there already. Now these albums at the top have been marked as favourites, that's why they're always at the top and they're nice and big. Poppy and Mabel haven't been given that status yet, but I want to do that obviously. So I'm going to scroll down my list of people until I find Mabel and Poppy, and I'm going to tap the little heart symbol next to their picture. When I go back to the top, I've now got all three cats and both dogs in that album screen at the top. And of course, just like you expect, if I tap onto one of those albums, I then get all the pictures of Poppy, or all the pictures of Mabel, or all the pictures of Polly, everything that my iPhone has found, just like it would do with people. Now, I found this to be pretty reliable. For example, Pudding and Mr Tibbs both look very similar. Sadly, we lost Mr Tibbs in January, and we had Pudding in about June time, and the iPhone has recognised that they're two different cats, even though they do look quite similar. So it is a really useful feature to have. One of the really nice new features in iOS 17 is that the lookup ability in Photos can do lots of new things one of which is looking up symbols on your car dashboard. Now you might think, well, how useful is that actually going to be? But trust me, if your car breaks down, like mine did here, it's incredibly useful. All you have to do is take a photo of your dashboard with those warning lights lit up, and then photos will tell you what they mean, which is handy because I wouldn't have a clue otherwise. At the bottom of the screen, you have that look up button, the little eye, and when you tap onto it, you then get that sliding panel of information. There's now a new option for auto symbols, and when you tap on there, it will find any symbols they can recognise in your photo, and it will give you a short description of what each one means. That means I can see just what parts of my car are broken, and how expensive that trip to the mechanic is going to be. Luckily, in my case, it turns out it's just a flat battery, but for some reason that ended up lighting up my whole dashboard like a Christmas tree, but it wasn't too bad to get it fixed. You can now go back to old portrait mode photographs, even taken before you updated your phone, and you can change the focus mode on those images, which means that you can save pictures that didn't work, or you can create new exciting compositions using existing photographs. Here I've got a photo that I took earlier in the year when I was in Boston, and it's a portrait mode photo. So when I press edit, you get that orange box around my face, which shows that that's the part of the image to focus on. Of course, I can change how much background blur there is by using that slider at the bottom, just like I could always do. But what's brand new now in iOS 17 is if I tap on the background of my photo, the focus will shift. So now my face is blurred and the background is in focus instead. I can change this to any part of my image, and as I tap around I can get the perfect shot. This is really useful if perhaps you wear glasses or have hair that wasn't quite in focus in the original photograph, because now you can zoom in and you can go to the edge of that area and make that in focus, and that portrait mode effect will look far clearer than it did before. The lookup feature in Photos for iOS has always been really helpful at finding landmarks or pieces of art or details on animals. 
But with iOS 17, it's got a few new tricks. For example, in this picture of some food, there's now a lookup option at the bottom. And you might be thinking, well, that's great, Jacob, it's going to say it's a lemon tart or a lemon cheesecake. But actually, it goes one step beyond that. You see, if I tap onto that lookup option, not only do I get to see the name of that particular item of food, I also get some suggested recipes as well. Now, there's a quick disclaimer that it's not 100% perfect. If you take a photo of a burger, it's not going to know exactly what sort of burger that is. But it's a really good starting point, and for me, I can actually find the recipe that I want and simply tap straight through and get the ingredients, the method, and I could start cooking if I wanted to. Or I could just go back to the restaurant because this was delicious. Editing photos on iPhone is really easy to do, but sometimes it takes quite a few taps to get to where you want, and a good example of that is if you wanted to crop this photo, say of the tool ships in Falmouth Harbour. I'd have to go to edit and then to crop and then to choose a size and then to make it smaller and then press done and then press save. It's the whole thing. All I want to do is actually just get this particular boat and look, in the top corner, there's a new button. Remember, I haven't actually gone into edit mode, I've just zoomed into my photo here. If I tap that new crop button, it will then take me straight to the crop page with a bounding box of the shape of my screen on that photo already for me. From here, I can then find you the crop that I want so I can make sure I get the whole tool ship in. And then all I have to do is press done and that crop is saved. Literally two taps rather than about eight. So much easier and a real time saver. How many times have you looked at the tag on a piece of clothing and you thought, what on earth do those symbols mean? Can I put it in a hot wash? Can I tumble dry it? What can I do here? Well, in iOS 17, the lookup feature in Photos now includes those symbols. So if you take a photograph of the tag in the garment, just like this, you can then use the lookup button on the bottom toolbar and it will automatically show you laundry options. When that laundry screen comes up, you will then see all of the symbols on that tag along with a full description of what each one actually means. On my garment here, you can see the tags got those descriptions on already, which means you can check how accurate this service really is. On a lot of garments, you won't have that writing, you just have the weird hieroglyphic symbol type things, and hopefully that means you'll never end up shrinking your favourite sweater in the tumble dryer again. And that also means I can't blame it on the tumble dryer anymore, it's just eating too many biscuits. Anyway, that's besides the point. Gosh, that's a lot of quick tips already. I hope you're finding this video useful, and if you are, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel down below. I'm making iPhone quick tips all the time, and that way you won't miss any more. Okay, this next batch of videos I call Bits and Bobs. Lots of different things from different apps that I think you'll find really interesting. One of the changes you'll notice straight away in iOS 17 is that the keyboard is slightly different as you're typing. For example, it now has autocomplete built in. That means as you're typing, no matter what app it might be in, if the iPhone can predict what you might say next, so perhaps a commonly used sentence or a phrase that you often use, you'll get a little greyed out suggestion in the text box where you're typing. Now, of course, you can ignore this and just carry on typing as normal, but if that suggestion is what you want, simply tap on the spacebar and it will auto-complete that for you. It might be the rest of the word or the whole rest of the sentence. The more you use it, the more it learns and the better and quicker your typing will become using this machine learning built into iPhone. In the Maps app on iOS 17, you can now download maps to use offline. That means if you're travelling in a different country and you haven't got data, or perhaps you just got no signal, you can still use the maps and the directions all offline. It's super easy to get set up as well. In the Maps app, you're going to press onto your little profile icon, and then from here you're going to go to Offline Maps. Now, iPhone will suggest perhaps a map or two that you might want to use, maybe somewhere you visit often or where you live. So for me, it's found Cornwall, which we'll download in a second. But I also want to add the City of London, so I'm going to choose Download New Map, and in the search box, I'm simply going to search for London. Now, when I tap on the result I want, you'll see this kind of rectangular box over the part of London in the map, and this is the area that we're going to use as an offline map by downloading it. Of course, I can change the size and shape of this area, and I can zoom in and out on the map as well. So I'm just going to zoom into central London and get this snippet here. At the bottom, it tells you how large this download will be, do be aware of that because it can add up quite quickly if you've got a big area. And then simply tap download and it will save that map as an offline map for you. Okay, now that's downloaded, I've actually downloaded the Cornwall map as well. And I want to show you how clever this really is. So I'm going to completely quit the Maps app and then jump into Control Center and turn on airplane mode and disable Wi-Fi. That means there's now no data, no cell signal, nothing on my phone. But if I go back into the Maps app and then go down to Cornwall, 
I can still browse everywhere that I need to look at, and I can even create a route to a destination like the train station here. You really have to remind yourself that this is working completely offline because it does seem to work exactly as it would normally work with a signal, and that makes it great for traveling or places of no cell service. In the Notes app on iOS 17 and later, you can now embed PDF documents in line in your note, and then you can annotate them and draw on them whatever else you want. Here, you can see that I'm using the markup tools to cross off the Lego Mario figures I've got already, but I need to add Series 4 and Series 5 onto here so I don't miss any. I've got in front of me a paper copy of the Series 5 guide, and I'm simply going to scan it into notes by pressing those three dots on the top toolbar and then pressing Scan Document. From here, I can simply get a scan of my document by holding my phone just in the air above it, nice and still, and it will place that in my note for me. I can drag and drop this and put it in position, and I can use those markup tools without having to even open the PDF document because it's embedded in the note like this. And of course, you can insert PDF documents from your phone itself. So if I jump out of notes and instead go into the files app, here I've got the series four guide. And all I'm gonna do is tap and hold on the file, come out of files with my other finger, and drag and drop this back in notes to where I want it to go. When my finger lets go of that document, it will embed the PDF just like before. This is a really handy feature and it makes notes even more useful than before, especially when working with PDF documents. AirDrop in iOS 17 has completely changed how it works. Yes, you can still do it the old fashioned way by pressing the share button and choosing a device, but it's now so easy to simply hold two iPhones head to head, so top to top, and it will share your file between them almost like magic. All you need to do on the iPhone that's sending the file or the photo or the video is to have that open on your screen. So I've got a picture here of my cat open on the screen ready to go, and when I bring Safi's phone up to the top, this happens. That sound effect means the phones are connected, the file is sent across from one to the other, and now it's visible on both iPhones just like that. You don't have to accept or receive the file because it knows if your phones are touching then probably you want that file anyway. But of course, if you take your phone away, it will cancel it before it gets sent. Okay, let's talk about wind. Not the best start to a YouTube video, I suppose. In the weather app on iOS 17, there is now a wind map that shows you the wind in your area, where it's coming from, where it's going, and how strong it is. It's a really interesting new tool, which is a really good addition to the weather app. To access it, simply press the map button in the bottom corner, and then from here you can use the layers button in the right hand corner at the top there to choose the wind map. You're then going to get this really lovely blue and white map, and you can see the air currents moving as they are around you, and at the bottom you can use that forecast bar to move forward through time, either by dragging it or by pressing play, see how the wind is going to change in your area. Now while I'm recording this video, there's an extreme weather event happening in America where a hurricane is about to make landfall in Florida. Whilst I hope that everyone there is staying really safe, it's an interesting time to look at the wind map because it does show you that hurricane and where it's potentially going to go. So again, this could be a feature that's quite useful should you ever need it, and to be honest, I really hope that you don't. The Notes app on iOS 17 has had a really helpful update, where you can actually link to different notes within a note itself. So I've got one here about places to visit when I go to Florida next year, and what I want to do is add some more detail to these theme parks at the top. But the problem I've got is if I start adding in all the rides I want to go, and then the maps and the websites, that list is going to get very, very long in one note, and it'll be really hard to keep track of everything. So I've actually made two separate notes, one for Universal Studios and one for Isle of Adventure, and I'm going to embed that into my main master note. And all I'm going to do is tap on the blank line, go sideways on that menu a couple of times, and then press add link. Now from here you can put in a URL for a website, but there's a really cool trick. And that is simply to start typing in the name of your note. No URLs, no weird links, just the name. As I type in Universal Studios, you'll see it pops up, and when I tap on there, I can add that as a link to my other note. I get this little hyperlink option. Let's do it one more time on the line underneath. I'm going to tap, going to go across sideways, add link, and this time I'll search for Islands of Adventure. Now I've added them both to that note, I can simply tap on the link and it will jump straight to that note. This means that I can organise my thoughts and ideas far easier, and I'm not going to get bogged down in one massive long note. And a top tip as well is if you link to another note, on that second note, put a link back to the original just like this. That way you can really quickly jump between them. It's almost like making a web page, isn't it, in the Notes app? All right, 
Here are some new things in the FaceTime app for your iPhone. How often have you tried to FaceTime someone only for them to be busy or unable to answer and talk? But there's no way of leaving a message saying why you've called, so they're probably thinking, well, what on earth does Jacob want? Well, now on iOS 17, if I make a call that isn't answered, say to my fiance Safi, I'll get a new option to either cancel, to call again, or to leave a video message. And this is basically like a video voicemail, which is really easy to use. If I tap onto a called message, I get a three, two, one countdown, and then I can leave a little message explaining why I called, and perhaps asking you to call me back later on. When I'm done recording that message, I can watch it back if I wanted to and retake the message, or I can just send. And that's it, I've left a visual voicemail on Safi's iPhone for FaceTime. It's a really simple feature to use, but one that adds so much more value to your iPhone. FaceTime on iOS 17 has got a whole load of new tricks that will make your video calls more engaging than ever. And most of them can be triggered using simple hand gestures. So all I need to demo this is to have a FaceTime call from someone on my phone. Oh, perfect. I'll answer that one now and I'll join the call with myself. Now, what you can see on the main screen is Jacob on his Mac. And in the bottom corner is Jacob on the iPhone. Now the iPhone's on iOS 17, but the Mac is not yet up to date. So all the effects that you see, you're going to see the difference between the old system and the new system. So keep an eye on that bottom corner. In fact, if I give a thumbs up, just like that, you're going to see the little emoji floating up from my hand. And it works for thumbs down too, as you might expect. Now remember, just because you can't see them on the main video here doesn't mean the recipient can't see them. On my Mac, I can see all of these reactions beautifully. In fact, they're so good, let's give it a double thumbs up. Woo! Look at that, some fireworks. And I guess a double thumbs down. Oh, that's sad, that's a rainstorm. But there are lots of other gestures you can do as well. For example, you can make a heart symbol with your hands and you get a little heart that comes out. You could do a peace sign to get some balloons, or for some reason I don't quite understand, you can do two peace signs and you get a confetti explosion behind you like this. And then the final one is if you do mock hands, just like this with both of your hands, you get some lasers coming out from behind you. But these gestures, they can be a bit hard to remember unless you're used to them. So the other way you can activate them is simply to tap and hold on your picture in the bottom corner and then you get a floating menu where you can choose any reactions just like this. Just another little way iOS 17 has improved your iPhone. Now with iOS 17, you don't have to worry if you can't answer a FaceTime call there and then, because people now have the option to leave you a video voicemail. Here, Safi's got a missed notification from me for a FaceTime call I made earlier that she couldn't watch at the time. But if she taps onto there, it opens up the FaceTime app, and from here on that list of calls, you can see there's a video message there from Jacob. When she taps onto here, she'll get that message from me just like this. That means she won't have to wonder why I was calling, she'll understand exactly what I wanted. And then at the end of that message, she can make the choice to either start a new FaceTime call there and then, or to reply by sending a text message. If she presses on text message, it will then go straight into messages and you can reply just like normal. It's a really small improvement, but it makes your iPhone so much better than before especially when you're doing lots of FaceTime calls. One of my favourite iOS 17 features is undoubtedly contact posters. Have a look at these. One of the most visual differences in iOS 17 is now when you get a phone call from a contact and you get their beautiful colourful contact card rather than just their name at the top. You can customise how yours looks. Jump into the contacts app and then from here at the very top of the contacts app you can find your details called my card. Now when I tap onto here, I then have this option for customising my contact photo and my contact card. I'll tap onto here now. As you can see, I've got one Memoji one set up already, but let's go through that process and make a brand new one. So I'm going to tap on the plus button, and then we're going to choose a new contact poster. From here, at the bottom, I've got three different options. Photo, Memoji, or Monogram. The Monogram is just going to have your initials. It's quite dull, quite boring, but I guess maybe professional. But I want to go for the Memoji option, because that's very much what I like. When you tap onto there, you can then choose the emoji you want to use, and then you can choose a variety of different poses. Fun fact, some of the poses here are only available in the Contacts app. You can't get these first ones as stickers, for example, in other apps. Now, I like the little one with the hand waving. I think that's quite friendly, and if you're getting a phone call, that seems like a nice thing to see. So I'm going to go onto there and then press Next. And then from here at the bottom, I can choose the colour of my background of my contact poster. There's a set of predefined colours, and of course you can tap through them. You can make them darker or lighter. But you can also press the little colour wheel in the top left corner, at which point you can get an exact colour, even down to typing in the hex code if you want to. 
For me, I obviously want teal, and I've got that saved as a favourite just here. Wow, I mean this is looking great already. The only thing left to do is to change the text at the top, and this is how your name will be displayed to people that you call, so it's important that you make it custom to you. When you tap on there, you've got four different font choices, and for each one you can make it a thicker or a thinner line to really emphasise the personality you want to go for. I'm going to go for the round, friendly looking font, and I'll make it a bit thicker like this. Then, just like before, you can choose the colours. Feel free to experiment with these colours, but I've got a top tip for you, and that is if you swipe right the way to the end, you can then get that colour wheel option again. And then from here, I'm actually going to use the colour picker to extract a colour from my Memoji sticker. In this case, I'll go for my skin tone. I think this looks really great, because now the colour matches that Memoji, and the background ties it all together beautifully. When you're finished, you can save your contact poster, and you can change your contact picture if you want to as well. That's the one that shows up next to your messages, for example, when you text someone. I'm going to skip that for now, and then look, my contact card itself is updated as well. I can now see that lovely emoji, the teal background, and my name in the font that I chose. This is a really nice way of personalising your iPhone, and making it feel just like yours. One of the most visually obvious changes on iOS 17 will happen any time you get a phone call from someone, because their contact poster will now take over your screen, and you'll see the image that they want to share with you before you answer that call. Of course, you can customise your own contact poster, and to do that you need to go to the Contacts app, and at the very top, where it has your name, tap onto My Card. From here, there's then an option to update your contact poster and profile picture, which I'll tap onto now. As you can see, I've got a Memoji picture set up already, but if I press Edit, I can then add a new contact poster. And just like lock screens, you can change between these whenever you fancy it. On this new screen, I have three different options at the bottom. A photo, an emoji, or a monogram. I'm going to go for the photo option, and iOS is automatically going to find pictures tagged as me that it thinks would look good on this particular screen. As much as that picture of me of a giant pizza is funny, I don't think it's a great thing to have when I'm calling someone. It might make them very hungry. So what I'm going to do is scroll down until I find a picture that I really like, and for me, I really like this picture of myself at Glastonbury a couple of years ago. If I tap onto there, I can then use two fingers to position this on the page. If I zoom out, iOS will automatically fill in the top of that image for me as well. Now, just like the lock screen on iOS, you can also use the depth effect, so it will extract part of that picture and put it in front of the text if you want it to. You can use the little three dots in the bottom corner to enable or disable this. And then, the whole process is very much like making a new lock screen. As I swipe between the different options, I can choose the style of that image. On some options, I can change the colour as well, like on a colour wash perhaps, or a colour gradient. And I can get some really interesting effects as I scroll between these different pictures. Now, I'm going to go to the one where I have a plain colour background, so my face is coloured in black and white, and now I can choose a colour background using the option at the bottom. There are some predefined colours here, but you know me, I like my teal. So I'm going to use the colour wheel option here, and then I can choose the exact shade that I want, either by typing in the hex code, or by using a favourite colour at the bottom like I've got here. I think this is looking pretty good now, in fact I think it's nearly finished. The last thing to customise is how my name is displayed on the contact poster. So I'm going to tap onto my name, and I've got a choice of four different fonts. For each one, you can make the line thicker or thinner, and despite only having four fonts, you can have lots of different ways it looks by changing that thickness. I think this looks pretty good, and then just like before, we can choose a colour as well. I'm going to go white to make it really pop and stand out against the teal. And now that's finished, I'm going to press done. I'm not going to change my profile picture, so I'm going to skip that step, but now back in the contacts app, you can see my contact card looks exactly what I want it to. One of the most fun things in iOS 17 are the new sticker options, from live stickers to emoji stickers and everything in between. Check out these quick tips now, and maybe press that subscribe button if you haven't already. One of the most obvious changes in iOS 17 is the Messages app. Before, you had all of your stickers and message apps right there underneath your text bar, but now you have to press the plus button to find them. So imagine you wanted an emoji sticker, maybe a thumbs up head or something like you had before. Well, if I press the plus button and then go on to more, eventually I'll find Memoji on that list. But Memoji now only has the talking heads, like you're watching me talk now, not the stickers. Hmm. This is because Messages has reorganised itself slightly to put all of your stickers and the apps that give you stickers all in one place. So when I press that plus button, there's now an option right at the top for stickers. And on here, I can then tap between different sticker packs and different apps. So I can go into Memoji, and I can get the emoji head that I wanted, and I can send that just like before. But all of these stickers, every single one, 
can also be dragged into your message thread and put anywhere you like on the screen. And the really cool thing is it applies to emojis as well. It's not just sticker apps anymore. So for example, I could drag this emoji on the photograph I sent earlier, and I could even be a bit creative and put the heart emoji on the heart hands memoji. God, that's a tongue twister. As I go through the different apps, I'll find all of my previous stickers and I can use them all either as inline messages, so part of my conversation, or by dragging them to a different part of the message thread to react to something or to make someone laugh. Without a doubt, one of the coolest features in iOS 17 are the new sticker options. You can use these stickers right across your phone, not just in messages, and you can create your own using a photograph. If I jump into the camera, I can get a quick photo of this Lego minifigure. Then I'm going to jump into the Photos app, and when I've found that photo, I'm going to tap and hold on the subject to extract that subject from the picture. You know it's worked because you get that white gold light that goes around the outside. Then on that floating menu bar, we have the sticker option, and tapping on here brings up the iMessage sticker drawer, just like this. You'll see immediately that that image is now a sticker in the sticker app along with the other ones that I've got. But if I tap on that, I can then add an effect. And here's where you can make your stickers really personal. You could go for a comic book style, or have a white border, or go for this sort of like semi-3D puffy style sticker. I really like the shiny option as well. But for this Lego minifigure, I think the white outline works brilliantly, so I'm going to select that one now. And that sticker is now saved, and I can use that anywhere I like on my iPhone. The stickers feature in iOS 17 really transforms message conversations, markup tools, just about anything you could type text into. You can make stickers out of your own photos, but you can also make animated stickers out of your live photos, and they look incredible. Here's how you get started. In the Messages app, I'm going to tap on the plus symbol on the left-hand side, and then choose Stickers from that new menu bar. On here, I have recently used stickers, but if I press that plus button, I can create a new one from my photographs. You'll see straight away on this preview page that some of those photographs move and some don't. That's the difference between live photos and regular photos. And if I scroll down, there are some pictures that I took of myself earlier, which are perfect for making reactions to messages. Now these are all live photos, and the way I filmed them was very simple. I took a photo using the 3 second countdown timer, and when it got to about 1 rather than 0, I'd start doing a hand gesture, maybe a thumbs up or a love heart or whatever it was, then the picture would take and I would stop doing the gesture. That creates movement, and it creates a really short clip, just like this. You're probably thinking, well yeah, that part's easy, but making it into a sticker and getting rid of the background, that's going to be a nightmare. Well, if you select the photo, just like this one, you'll see that it does that preview of how the live sticker will look, and within just a split second or two, the background will automatically get removed for you. You haven't got to do anything, the iPhone does it all. When you're happy, we can then save that sticker, and then I can use that in a message thread, just like any other sticker. Now you probably know that with stickers you can have different styles, like an outline or a comic or a shiny foil sticker. With a live one you can't add those effects, it's just the photo itself. In fact, if you try to add the effect, it will then take away the live action part of that photo. It still looks cool, but it's not as good as having an animated sticker in my opinion. Anyway, now that sticker is made, I can either tap on it once and send it in the message, or I can tap and drag it out of the sticker drawer and place it on top of a different message in the conversation thread, just like this. Emojis have got a whole new set of talents in iOS 17, and you can use them in really exciting and innovative new ways. If I go into a message thread like this one, you all know you can send an emoji as a text message just like normal, but what you can do now is you can tap and drag the emoji from that bottom page, whether it's in the search results or just in the emoji gallery, and then you can place it anywhere you like in the conversation. That might mean you can use it as an emoji reaction to someone's message, or perhaps like in this instance where I've got a photograph, I can put some emoji on the picture and have a bit of fun and make a little playful collage. This new way of communicating using emojis makes your iPhone better than ever with iOS 17. The new stickers in iOS 17 are fantastic and they can be used all over the place. And one of the main ways they can be used, that's kind of hidden actually, is in the markup tools. Now the markup tools are available all over your phone, for example in photos or PDF documents or if you're doing a sketch, and it's that floating toolbar at the bottom where you have the pen, the highlighter, the ruler, those sort of tools. And as well as being able to use those to annotate a photo, for example, like this one of me here, 
I can also press the plus button and now I can add a sticker. Now when I go onto here, it's going to bring up the same sticker drawer from the Messages app and I can use any of these stickers to add to my photo app. And excitingly, because emoji are now stickers as well, I can drag any emoji that I want onto my photo. So for example, this thought bubble, I can put it on there, I can make it bigger and smaller, I can rotate it just like you'd expect, and I can press in the corner to delete it if I wanted to. Let's add one more sticker, and this time I'm going for the Memoji stickers, and I'm going to choose a Memoji head to replace my actual head. When I found it, I can drag it on, and I can make it bigger and position it just as I like. I think that looks pretty fun. When I press done, it will then save that photo with the new stickers on top, and because it's now part of the photo, if I make any edits, for example applying a filter or making it black and white, it will apply to the stickers as well, which adds a really fun and interesting quality to your picture. But don't worry, if you decide actually no, I want to go back to what I had before, you can simply press the three dots in the corner of the photo screen, and then you can press revert to original. Then you're back to the photo you had before, with no stickers, no text, no highlighting, no filters, no nothing. We've had a couple of nice little changes to the music app this year, with more to come in iOS 17.2 soon. In fact, subscribe down below, and then you'll get the newest quick tips as soon as 17.2 is out. A nice little change in iOS 17 is that you can now see who was actually involved in the song that you're currently listening to. Who wrote it, who played in it, who produced it, all those sort of details. And it's really simple to access. From the now playing screen of any song, you're going to press the three dots next to the track name, and at the top of that menu you're going to choose Show Credits. From here you get a brand new screen with loads of information about who actually made that song. Who the singers were, who the performers were, the songwriters, the producers, who mixed it. All of that information is available for you in a way that simply wasn't possible on Apple Music before. And from here as well, there's a one-tap link to view all the lyrics of that song, which will show you the lyrics of the normal document rather than doing it in the time-synced way that you get on the Now Playing screen. Here's an update in iOS 17 that's almost impossible for me to demo on YouTube without getting a copyright strike. So we're going to pretend to play some music and in your head just promise me you're going to pretend to bop along, okay? Perfect. So you can now have a crossfade between songs in the Apple Music app. And what that means, very simply, is that when your songs are moving on to the next track in that playlist, it will automatically fade between the two, rather than waiting for one to finish and start on the next. It's what DJs do when they're mixing sound to make it sound really smooth and really seamless. To turn this on, we're going to jump into the settings app, and then we're going to scroll down a little bit until we get to music. From here, as you go down the page, there's a new option for crossfade. And when you turn this on, you can change the length of that fade as well, how much of the songs you want to mix. It's worth noting this won't work over AirPlay, only when you're playing it on your phone or through headphones. Then when you go back to your music and you reach the end of a song, remember we're pretending, aren't we? It will then fade automatically into the next one in a really seamless way. Didn't that sound great? Trust me, it did. There are some amazing new accessibility features this year, and these quick tips explain how they work. In this video, we're going to have a look at the new accessibility feature on iOS 17 called Assistive Access. This is a feature that will completely change how your device looks and how your device works, and it has real benefits for a lot of people. So we're going to jump into the Settings app and then go on to Accessibility. From here towards the bottom of that page is a section for General, and in here you have Assistive Access. I'm going to tap onto there now. There are a couple of little steps to go through to begin with, and one of which is to choose how you want your phone layout to look. So basically, what this feature is going to do, it's going to greatly simplify your iPhone experience. It's going to remove all of the clutter, all of the things that perhaps might get in the way, and strip it back to the real essentials. You can choose if you want to have this done as a row, so one after another vertically, or if you want a grid of large icons, perhaps more akin to a normal iPhone home screen. Next up, we're going to choose what apps you're going to have access to in this new mode. Now, there are five apps that are currently optimised by Apple to work in a different way in assistive access. So, phone, text, photos, music, and the camera. When you press the green plus button next to these, you can actually get some more options to fine-tune what those apps can and can't do. For example, can they access location data? Do you want them to access all your photos? those sort of things. And some of the apps have got controls as well that you can enable or disable. So for example, the camera, you can disable selfie mode, or you can disable video, or you can enable one mode, not the other. You can really fine tune what you're going to have access to or not when the setting is enabled. Now underneath these five apps are all the other apps currently on your iPhone. Now any of these apps can be added to assistive access, but they won't work in the same simplified way that those five core apps do. 
I'm wondering if perhaps in the future Apple might update more apps to be more simplified for this very reason. I'm going to jump down and just add the Eclipse app, for example, just to kind of show you how that works in this mode as well. And you can see I've got a lot of different permissions here to grant. So I'm going to very quickly go through and do that. And now I'm happy that I've got the app selected. I'm going to press continue at the bottom and we're going to get a little bit more information about assistive access. You can disable it at any time by pressing the lock button three times and you're going to put in a pin code to make sure it's protected. The next step is setting up that pin code. I'll do that very quickly now. And then all that's left to do is to enable assistive access. Your screen will go black for a moment or two while it reloads and then you're going to see this. Straight away, you're going to see your iPhone looks very, very different. A lot more simple, no wallpapers, no animations, and I can simply tap that nice big button to unlock my phone. Then I'm presented with the app launcher, and I've got those six apps I've just chosen. If I go into the phone app, for example, again, it's going to look very different to the phone app that you're probably used to having already. From here, I can quickly access key contacts, and I can make a phone call just like normal, but again, it just looks slightly simplified. And this simplified approach carries across to all five of those apps. For example, the Photos app here, I haven't got all the toolbars and menus and back buttons. I've just got my camera roll and I can explore those photos just like this. If I just go into camera as well, you can see here I've got the option for a photo or a video. Very simply labeled, nice big graphics. And when I tap onto one, I can then simply take a photo or record a video. All of these symbols, the colors, the graphics, they're designed to really stand out and to make your device more accessible than ever before. Now, if I go into the Clips app, which you might remember isn't optimized for this mode, you'll see that it looks more or less the same as normal with the addition of that nice big back button at the bottom. That means you can still use all the features of this particular app, but it isn't going to have that reduced interface like the other ones do. So it depends on perhaps who the device is for and what you want to have access to as to whether or not you want to enable other apps besides those key five. And then when you're finished with assistive access, you're going to tap the lock button three times, type in your pin code, and wait for your device to restart. And just like that, we're back on the original iPhone with iOS 17 running as normal. Assistive access is always just three taps away on that lock button, and you can then customize how it works a bit more once you have a chance to explore it. It is an incredibly powerful feature that genuinely completely changes how your iPhone works. And I think actually we should give full credit to Apple for making this mode in the first place. It's clearly taken a lot of designing work, a lot of coding work to make this come to life, but it makes that device so much more accessible for a huge amount of people. So Apple, well done for this new feature. I think it's fantastic. In this video, I'm going to talk you through how iOS 17's brand new accessibility feature called Point and Speak works in real life. Now, this feature is built into the Magnifier app, which is a really cool accessibility tool with loads of things built in. And Point and Speak is now another option in there. When we open the Magnifier app, we're going to press the little cog settings icon to make some changes to what's available. On this customizing screen, we have a list of different tools that are available in the magnifying app, and you're looking for detection mode. For me, it's actually there already, but if I just quickly take it off, it might look like this for you. By pressing that green plus button, it will then move up to that top list of items, and that means the detection mode is now ready to use in magnifier. So let's come off of this screen, and what we're going to do is we're going to find something to demo this feature on. I'm going to go for my washing machine. When you tap onto detection mode, you're going to see a new option bar on the left hand side. And here you can turn on or off things for the app to detect. For example, doorways or people and how far away you are. At the bottom, we have the option for point and speak and I'll make sure that's turned on. And now the really clever part. As long as your camera can see text on something and it's fairly easy to read for the phone's camera, you can simply put your finger on the text in real life or point to it and you'll see a yellow box that comes around and it will read it aloud like this. Hand detected. Auto. Clean. Color. Care. Time. Saver. Auto. As you can see, it's pretty accurate. And whilst it's not 100% perfect, it's a really useful tool to have. This is certainly not going to be a feature for everyone, but for people who do need it, who would benefit from this, it's a really valuable addition to iOS 17. One of the new accessibility updates on iPhone is called Personal Voice. And whilst it's not for everyone, it's incredibly powerful for people that perhaps have a condition where their voice is going to degenerate over time. Personal Voice can be found under Settings, and then Accessibility, and then when you scroll down to Speech, the new Personal Voice option is there. The way it works is you're teaching your iPhone how you sound, 
by reading out a variety of different phrases and sentences. Your iPhone will then go away and it will take all of that speech data and it will synthesize a new voice, a little bit like a Siri voice, but using the data you've given it rather than the Siri's data. The actual process of recording your voice does take a little bit of time, around about 15 minutes, and you need to be in a quiet, relaxed environment, so you can't be anywhere too noisy or out and about. When you're ready, the process will guide you through these steps, and it will do a quick check of the background sound as well by asking you to record a phrase like this. I'm creating a personal voice with my iPhone. You can see at the bottom that sound is being recorded, and as long as your background is quiet enough, it will progress automatically onto the next step for you. At this point, the process will begin properly, and it's worth noting that you can stop this at any time and come back to it, and it will save your progress. But essentially, you're going to read 150 different sentences and phrases in your natural speaking voice. About half of the people live in the state's metro area. I'm not going to make you listen to all 150 of these, so we'll whiz along a little bit like this. But what's going to happen is the iPhone will learn your voice and it will learn the mannerisms you use when you speak. And at the end of that process, your phone has to go away and do a bit of thinking. In fact, for me, it took about 24 hours, so quite a long time. Now, that thinking will only happen when your phone is locked and on charge. So if you want to speed the process along, you can leave it in the dock, perhaps on charge all day. But I found for me overnight worked best. And in the morning, I had a little notification that said your personal voice is ready. So if I jump back into settings now and go back to accessibility and then personal voice, you can see there now it's got my personal voice set up. If we go back a screen and then choose live speech, we can then start using that voice. All I'm going to do when I've turned that toggle on is press the lock button three times and I can then type in the message that I want my new personal voice to read for me, just like this. Hello, this is my new personal voice. Now, it is not perfect by any means, but for someone who perhaps might be in danger of losing their voice, this could be a real lifeline for them. It sounds quite good, although not quite like the real thing. Let's try one more. Still, a great new feature to have in iOS 17. Yeah, it does definitely sound like me, there's no denying that. Let's have a quick look now and see what's changed in the Safari app. One of the nice updates in Safari for iOS 17 is the ability to now listen to a page. For example, getting Siri to read that page for you. Now, from my experience, this works on any website where the reader mode would work before. If you haven't remembered, reader mode is accessible from the address bar on the website. And when you tap on the two A's, you get the option to go into reader mode. This gets rid of adverts, clutter, distractions, and it gives you a really nice reading experience. This is the text that Siri will read to you as well. It's not going to read all the hyperlinks and articles and all the rubbish around the page. So we'll come out of reader mode and press the two A's again. And now we have the option to speak page. And this is what happens when you press it. Intoxicating. Bruce Springsteen at BST Hyde Park reviewed. Springsteen is still the most magnetic performer imaginable. As you can hear, Siri is reading the article for me. And the great thing is, if I leave the website, if I come out of Safari completely, it will keep playing in the background as background audio. I can tap and hold the Atlantic Island, or use the control center to pause this audio. And you'll see it's almost like a music track, it's three and a half minutes long. That's because the whole article is ready to go, and you can listen to it when you need to. You also have some more options inside of Safari to change how the article is read to you. If I tap back onto the bottom toolbar, I then have listening controls as an option. From here, I can change the speed at which it's read to me. I can make it read twice as quickly as I wanted to. And I can also then stop and pause and resume from here as well. This is a really nice little update to Safari that will make web pages much more accessible to everyone. And it's just another way iOS 17 has improved your phone. Now, private browsing has been available in Safari for many, many years. And if you're not sure, it's when you can browse the internet without leaving a search history or saving cookies on your device. So for example, if you're doing some Christmas shopping for your fiance and you don't want her to find out what you've been searching for, you could use a private browsing window for that. In iOS 17, you can now use Face or Touch ID to protect your private tabs, which means they're more secure than ever. To enable this feature, all I'm going to do is go into the Settings app and then scroll down until I reach Safari. From here, we're then going to scroll down to Private Browsing and we're going to enable that secure mode. Then, when I go back into Safari, back into my private tab, you'll notice straight away Face ID does a check to make sure it's me accessing that tab. And now we're back to our second category of bits and bobs, all the things that didn't fit elsewhere in the video. In fact, this is the last group of quick tips you're going to see from me today. So please, please do consider subscribing down below if you found this video useful. And let me know in the comments which ones of these tips you found most interesting. 
I wonder how many times you've downloaded a PDF document from Safari, only to then realise it's a real pain to fill it out. If I jump into files, I've got a PDF form here, and of course you'd have to zoom in the text box, use the markup tools, and then try and scribble your name into those boxes. It's very messy and quite frustrating to do that. But hang on, if I just undo this a second, there's a new button on that toolbar at the bottom on the right hand side. I'm just going to tap on that a second. And what that's going to do is that's going to scan my PDF document and work out where text fields are. And they're all going to turn blue, just like this. Then I can simply tap onto one of those blue text boxes and I can use the keyboard to type straight in. Or I can use autofill on my keyboard. So for example, if I tap onto my name, I can autofill Jacob and then autofill Walcock as well. This means I can fill out a PDF form on my device without having to print it, without having to use it on the iPad or a pencil. It just makes it a lot easier, basically. And you could also use the plus button in the bottom corner if you want to add text boxes that perhaps are missing, or if you want to add a signature, just like this. That means you can then save your document and email it back to wherever it needs to go to. And that's a really helpful feature to have in your iPhone. As well as losing the Hey from Hey Siri, you can now chain commands together, which means that you haven't got to keep saying Hey Siri, Hey Siri, Hey Siri in between each command. Now that sounds a bit weird, but this is how it actually works in practice. Hey Siri, what's the temperature in the bedroom? It's 23.3 degrees Celsius in the bedroom. Ah, okay. In that case, put the fan on. It's remembered that I was talking about the bedroom, and it's chosen the bedroom fan as opposed to anything else. It's a more natural conversation. Let's try one more. Siri, turn the bedroom lights on. Perfect. And could you also turn the fan off in 10 minutes? And just like that, there's an automation to turn the fan off in 10 minutes' time. You can chain multiple commands together, not just two at a time, and it will remember what you are doing as you're going forwards in that command. That means you haven't got to keep repeating yourself time and time again when talking to Siri. The Health app on iOS 17 has had a really big change in one particular way this year, and that's around the idea of mental well-being. If I go into the Health app and then go to Browse at the bottom, there's now a section for mental well-being. And when I tap onto that, I get new sorts of data and information in the Health app. The one that I'm interested in is called State of Mind, and that's right at the top there. So when I tap onto that, I now get this really interesting looking screen, and it tells me how I'm feeling at the moment. Now, it hasn't obviously guessed how I'm feeling. I've, I've had to tell it that, and I'll show you how that works later. But what you can do is you can swipe sideways and you can see over time how your mood and emotions have changed. Now, viewing it day by day is perhaps interesting, but it doesn't really show me much information that's usable. So at the bottom, there's a button that says show charts. And when you go onto here, I then get a graph showing over the last week how my mood has changed. There's a scale here that goes from very pleasant to very unpleasant, and neutral's kind of in the middle. And you can see here, how that's looked over the last week. You can explore this data further by using the associations, which links tags that you put in when you track things. Again, I'll show you that later. And really interestingly, that last option there will let you compare it against other health data. So if you look here, you can see how the number of exercise minutes in the last week correlates with the mood tracked above. And you can change this to hours of daylight, you can change your sleep, lots of different things to see if there are any connections to your mental health. So it's quite an interesting way of browsing that data and perhaps getting a better insight into your own state of well-being and your mental health as a result of that. But you're probably thinking, well, where's it got this data from? How do I add it? What's going on? We're going to come out of that screen and then in the top corner, we're going to press log. Now from here, you can choose an emotion that you're feeling at this moment in time, or you can choose to log a general mood for the whole day. I'll show you in a minute how we can make this process simpler by using reminders to kind of give us a prompt. But for now, let's log how we're feeling at this moment in time, an emotion for now. And I've now got this really colourful and interesting graphic. I can use the slider to move it right if I'm feeling more positive, or left if I'm feeling less positive. So if I go right, you can see it becomes more pleasant, more round, more flowery, all the way up to very pleasant at the end. Conversely, if I move the direction the other way, I'll go back past neutral towards slightly unpleasant, and then unpleasant ending up at very unpleasant. And you'll see those shapes, the colours change, and they look a little bit spikier, perhaps, than they did before. You can choose how you're feeling right now based on this visual representation. And there's not just, like, five points. It's a completely fluid scale, so you can put it exactly where you want it to be. Right now, I'm feeling quite pleasant, so I'm going to move the slider along to there. And then when you move on to the next screen, there's the option of putting a couple of keywords to explain why you've made that choice. I'm feeling quite happy and relieved, actually, because I've made good progress on my videos today. And I guess if you're watching this now, that means it's gone well. 
So I'm going to tag those two options, and there are more options underneath if you wanted them. When you move on to the next screen, you're then going to add a little bit more information about why you've made that choice, why are you feeling that way. So for me, the factors that have kind of influenced it, I guess, are completing some tasks on my to-do list and getting some work done. So I'm going to choose those two. And there's a text box at the bottom as well. None of this is compulsory. You haven't got to do any of these tags or text. But I'm going to put a few words in here just to kind of say what I've done today and why I'm feeling like this. And when I finish and press done, it's going to log that emotion onto the day for me. You can then see on that overview all the different things that I've felt as the day's gone on. And it picks out some of those keywords to kind of create a summary as well of the day. If I wanted to track an overall mood for the whole day, I'd press log again. And I can do the exact same process. But rather than focusing in on one particular moment that's happening right now, I'm reflecting on the whole day to make that decision. Now, if you're watching this far into the video, you're probably thinking, yeah, this looks like something that I might benefit from, that perhaps I could get some use out of by looking at that data over time and, and comparing it to different things and just monitoring and checking in on how I'm feeling. But I'm not sure that I want to go into the health app and then find this every single day. I'm going to just forget. Well, there are options to add reminders automatically for you. If I scroll down to the bottom of this page and go to options, I can then turn on different reminders. I can set reminders to go off during the day when things are happening, and I can even schedule custom reminders. So I might have one for first thing in the morning, perhaps, to have a feeling of how I slept or, or something like that. You can use your Apple Watch to track this as well, and it's super quick on there, just like you'd expect. And over time, that data will build up and you can start comparing it and looking for trends and maybe finding some patterns. I hope this overview has been helpful for the state of mind and mental health tracking in iOS 17. Quite frankly, I think it's a really important thing to do to keep track of how we're feeling and to reflect on what's causing those different changes as time goes on. There are lots of apps that do it, but having it built right into the health app seemed like a really accessible first step for a lot of people. If you're anything like me, you might use reminders to keep track of your shopping list. In fact, I've got a shared list with my fiance where we can both put things on. Then when we go to the shop, it's all there ready to go. But as that list grows and grows, it becomes quite hard to keep track of everything. And I end up tapping and dragging to reorder things so I can group similar objects together for my shop. So put all the fruit and veg together, put all the bread together. Well, iOS 17 has got a new setting in reminders that does it all automatically for you. So while I'm on my shopping list, I'm going to press the three dots in the top corner and then show list info. From here, there's an option for the type of list you want. And right now it's a regular list, but if I tap on here, I can toggle it to a shopping list. This is quite a niche setting, but for shopping lists, it is absolutely amazing. If I come off of here, any second now, there you go, my list has automatically arranged itself by food type and product type. So when I go shopping, I can get all of my similar items together at the same time from my shopping list. Of course, I can minimize and expand these categories, I can reorder them, and I can move things between them as well if I wanted to. I can even add new things at the bottom, and iOS will automatically sort it into the right place for me. Also in Reminders, I can also look at my items as columns rather than one massive long list. If I press those three dots again and then say View Columns, I can then swipe sideways. If my shopping list was particularly long, this will make it much easier to break down what I need to find in each area, without having to scroll up and down the whole time. Well, the day has finally come. We can now have multiple timers on iPhone. It only took, what, 17 years? Anyway, forget all of that. Here's how they work. I'm going to jump into the clock app, and at the bottom I'll go into timers, just like I would do normally. Now, this whole screen is being changed in iOS 17, and you can access recently used timers, so if you regularly have the same timer, you can quickly get it from here. But that's not why you're watching this video. If we go back to the top, we're going to start a new timer, and we're going to give it a name as well. This is also new in iOS 17. So perhaps in the kitchen, doing some cooking, I'm going to put the burgers in, and I'm going to be done in about 25 minutes time. So I'll give this timer a name, and then start it off as per usual. And in the past, this is all you could do. You could set a timer and leave it running. But actually, I need to put the chips in in five minutes time. I don't want to forget that. So I'm just going to press the plus button in the top corner, start a new timer for five minutes, call this one, put the chips in, and then press go. And just like you expect, I've now got a second timer on the go. Let's quickly add one last timer to get the salad and burger buns ready to go. And we'll start that one off in about 20 minutes time. Now, these timers are all running simultaneously. Of course, we can see our timers on the main timer homepage and clock. But if I leave the app completely, the dynamic island keeps you up to date as well. It will show the timer that's ending first up here, and if I long press on it, I'll get some more information. And we can also access multiple timers on our lock screen too. If I pull down from the top to go back to my lock screen, here you can see I've got a stack of timers. I'm tapping on it once, 
lets me view all of them that are currently active. And from here I can pause and I can cancel timers as well. Your home screen widgets in iOS 17 have gained a lot of new power in this update. And they're actually now completely interactive. So at the moment, while I'm making this video, it's just the kind of first party Apple apps that are working. But by the time you watch it, and in weeks and months to come, all of the apps that you use will start updating to this new feature. So what exactly do I mean by interactive widgets? Well, I can add a new widget just like I could do before. Tap and hold the home screen, press the plus button, and then search the app you want. I'll grab a music widget quickly and put that on as well. But now all of these widgets, rather than just opening the app, are actually fully interactive. And so because these are now interactive, I can literally interact with them on the home screen without having to open any app at all. So in the HomeKit app in the top corner, I can turn the fan on and turn the light in my office on just from the home screen by tapping those buttons. On the reminders list, I can tick an item off just by pressing the circle and it's gone. I haven't got to open the whole app and go through the whole process. On the music player, I can press play, I can press pause, just like you'd expect. Of course, I can still open up the app just like before by tapping onto the main body of the widget, like the empty space or the main text, and that will open the app just like it would do before iOS 17. But having this new feature just means speeding up a lot of interactions with your phone because you haven't got to go to the apps anymore. One of the big new features in iOS 17 is called Live Voicemail. And it means you'll get a preview of what the person is calling you about. If you can't answer the phone, then you can decide if you want to answer it or not. All I need to do is wait for a phone call to come in, um, maybe like this. But of course, I don't want to answer that phone call because then it will bypass voicemail. Now, if I didn't answer this call and it just timed out, it would automatically go into the new voicemail feature. But to speed things along, you have the option to accept, reject, or send it to voicemail. I'll tap on there now. And now Safi on her phone is going to get a pre-recorded message from Siri basically saying she's going to voicemail, leave a message. As she starts talking, just like this, you're going to see in real time that appear on my phone, so I know what she's calling about. Of course, I could then leave this and revisit the voicemail later. I could accept the call and answer and start talking straight away, or I could reply by sending a text message saying that I'm too busy to talk right now. But this new feature means you know why that person's calling, you can judge if it's important enough to answer the call there and then, and it's a really good quality of life improvement for your iPhone. Being able to share AirTags across different iCloud accounts is a feature I've wanted for a long time on iOS, because we have things like our cat, Pudding, who has an AirTag on his collar, but my fiancé and I can't share his location, only one of us can have it on our phones at any given time. So here you can see Safi's phone and my phone, and you can see on the Find My app that Safi has got Pudding on there now. However, in iOS 17, there's a new option to share this AirTag. When you tap on to add person, you can then type in the iCloud address of the other person you want to share it with, in this case, my iCloud address. And then just like that, in Find My on my iPhone, there's now an invitation from Safi to accept sharing that pudding air tag. When I tap on here, it then appears in a new section called Shared With You, and I can use it just like any other air tag on my account. And another really good use for this feature is if you're traveling together, say in the car, and the air tag's linked to my phone, but not Safi's, Sometimes the AirTag will start beep, beep, beeping, thinking that it's traveling with someone that doesn't recognize it. Well, if you share that AirTag with both accounts, that won't happen anymore, which is a nice little improvement to have. If you've got AirPods Pro, you're going to notice a couple of brand new settings now you've updated to iOS 17. If I jump into the settings app and then tap onto my connected AirPods at the top, on here, I've got various options for noise control, some of which we've had before. Now, if you're not sure, noise control is where it blocks out those background sounds, a bit like noise cancellation. So you can have noise control turned off. You can have that noise cancellation on and lose all the background sounds. Or you can have transparency mode, where you can kind of hear as if you weren't wearing headphones. Well, there's a new mode in iOS 17 called Adaptive. And this will detect what's around you and get rid of the background noise, but not the important noise. So, for example, if there's a washing machine or dishwasher in the background, but people talking, you'll still hear people talking, but you won't necessarily hear that appliance humming away in the background. There's also a very clever new feature called conversation awareness. And if I scroll down slightly, I have the option of turning this on or turning this off. And as you might anticipate, if it's turned on, your music or whatever you're listening to will dip down slightly in volume, the noise cancellation will come off, and you can hear the person you're talking to without removing your headphones at all. It's a really interesting feature, and it works surprisingly well in my testing. 
Of course, you won't always want to go in the settings app to make these changes. So actually, if you're playing a song or listening to music, simply jump into Control Center, long press on that AirPods icon, and then from here you can choose the noise control mode and the conversation awareness mode, just with those two little toggles there. With iOS 17, you can now shoot 48 megapixel photos on your camera without having to use a really large file size in the Pro formats. Here's how you can change the settings to enable this new mode. We're going to jump into the settings app to begin with, and then we're going to scroll right the way down until we find camera. I'm always surprised how far you have to go to get to camera, to be honest. And then from here, we're going to tap onto formats. From this screen, we're going to tap onto the Pro formats option, and here you've now got three options. The new one at the top is 48 megapixel HEIF, H-E-I-F, and that stands for High Efficiency Image Format. That's going to capture all the data of the 48 megapixel sensor, but it's going to do it as a much smaller file size than the old Pro Raw setting that you might have used before. So what I'll do is I'll choose this new HEIF option as my default, and then I'm going to jump straight out of settings and into the camera app instead. Now in the top right corner, I've got a new option to change formats. At the moment, you can see that 48 megapixel HEIF is turned off. That means when I get a photo, it will do the normal 12 or 24 megapixel resolution. But if I tap on here, it will enable 48 megapixel mode for me. Now, when I use the shutter and take a photo just like normal, I'll get a 48 megapixel image instead. I can also tap and hold that format button at the top, and I can choose between Pro Raw or Heath or Regular as well there. Now, those images have all been captured. I've got one standard 12 megapixel, one 48 megapixel Heath, and one 48 megapixel Pro Raw. Let's have a quick look and see how the file size compares to those three images. As you can see, the Heath is right in the middle, and it's a much smaller size than Pro Raw. So you get all the data of the 48 megapixels for about a tenth of the file size that you would have had before iOS 17. And if you like these videos, please do subscribe down below. That way you won't miss any more iPhone quick tips in the future.